Mm -hmm. Alrighty, so we're taking on um, part two of module two, Conquest and Colonization. Um, and we're going to be talking about the push for conquest and colonization uh, from a European perspective, um, which of course means that the dreaded European history that we all know and love um, will be coming into this lecture. Um, I want you to understand what's pushing Spain to colonize Florida. Um, I think that, that part is important. Um, but keep in mind, this is all not happening in a vacuum. So everything, the historical tradition of Europeans um, is playing into this, the religious concepts. And so it's important to kind of touch on these things. Um, and so hence the reason for the warning, um, be prepared. Okay, so first, what's happening in Europe? Um, well, let's review Spain's background a little bit. Um, Spain had been under the control of the Islamic Empire um, under the Umayyad dynasty. Um, this goes back to World I. Um, yeah, back to World I. Um, so if you've taken that, then you probably have discussed the Umayyad dynasty. But it was known, most of the Iberian Peninsula was known as Al-Andalus. Um, it was a kingdom um, under the Umayyad dynasty. I believe the Umayyads end up um, being, I guess, reconquered by another Islamic um, empire. But um, when that happens, Spain remains, or I'm sorry, the Iberian Peninsula remains um, all Andalus. Um, and so it becomes kind of like a tributary state to the new dynasty. Not that any of that is really important. But the push for Christianizing the Iberian Peninsula begins um, under Alfonso III of Asturias. And Asturias is a province of Leon um, in the kind of the upper um, left-hand corner of Spain. Um, by 1301, um, Castile and Leon have joined forces. And so slowly what they're doing is they're beginning to conquer territory held by Muslims. Um, and when they do this, of course, the Muslims are forced out um, and they begin to move further south um, in Muslim-held territory. But of course, gradually what, what is beginning to take place here is almost like a crusade called the Reconquista. And essentially what it is, is it's the reconquering of the Iberian Peninsula by Christian nations. Um, and eventually the establishment of the kingdoms of Portugal and Spain. Um, the kingdom of Leon and Castile um, get a boost in 1469 when Ferdinand of Aragon marries Isabella of Castile. And of course, Ferdinand and Isabella are the ones that send um, Columbus on his journey in 1492. Um, by 1139, you have the creation of the kingdom of Portugal. Um, and Afonso Enriquez is declared the king of Portugal. Um, he is recognized by the Pope um, several years later as the rightful ruler of Portugal. So eventually you have essentially two Reconquistas. You have the Spanish Reconquista, and then you have the Portuguese Reconquista. Um, and so Portugal will slowly develop its borders that we recognize, um, as well as Spain will do the same. Spain has a bigger job to do, though, because there's more territory. Um, and eventually, the Reconquista conquers the territory um, all the way down to right about here. Um, and there's Granada. Granada becomes the final city um, that is conquered by the Christians, and the Muslims um, abandon. Um, Granada and go across the Strait of Gibraltar into Northern Africa, which was at that time still predominantly um, Muslim. So what's important about this Reconquista portion is the fact that it ties into crusading efforts that we find like the First Crusade all the way through however many um, crusades you want to name because there's an argument about how many there truly are. But it is an extension of the crusading effort. There is no real question mark about that. Um, but historians are beginning to kind of make that correlation. Um, concerns about Muslims lead to the formation of the first Portuguese Navy. In 1180, you have the first naval battle 
Um, and what the Muslims are doing is basically attacking the coastal cities of Portugal and Spain, trying to um, conquer the forces there um, and put an end to the Reconquista. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't happen. Um, and by 1317, King Dennis of Portugal officially forms the Royal Navy. So what this does is it opens up an opportunity for especially Portugal, but also Spain. Um, as these territories are conquered, they, the Spanish and the Portuguese begin to raid the libraries and universities of the Muslim world um, because Spain and Portugal have these massive libraries there that had been uh, taken care of by the Muslims. <coughs> So there is this push for um, understanding what knowledge is in, in these libraries. And what they find is actually quite surprising. Um, what many people consider to be the Dark Ages, that period following the fall of Rome um, up until the Renaissance, um, is now a kind of um, this uh, kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's no longer recognized as the Dark Ages. What, many people argue, many historians are finding, is that there is a push within, um, through the Crusades, when the Crusaders are sacking the Muslim cities of the Middle East, they're finding, again, these libraries. And so all of this classical knowledge that had been thought to be lost um, with the fall of Rome actually had been stored in the libraries in the Muslim world. And so Europeans are beginning to um, take these back home to Europe and people are reading them and they're rediscovering all of the scientific knowledge. Um, if you're not familiar with this already, you should be, um, that the Muslim world was very heavy in terms of scientific thought and mathematics. And so it's no surprise that Portugal and Spain were the first to really embrace navigation, um, exploration, and all of these are tied to this knowledge of mathematics that they are discovering in the libraries um, of the conquered cities. So what does Portugal try to do? Portugal has four main goals, or at least you can look at four trends within their conquest and discovery um, bucket list, so to speak. Um, they're looking for territorial expansion into Africa. Um, because one thing they do know is that there, there's a very rich and lucrative trade market in Africa. Um, trade has been going on there since the beginning, the dawn of man. Um, and so there, there's gold, there's slaves, there's spices, there's cloth that's being traded across the desert, um, as well as up and down the Nile River. So they want to plug into this, and they do this in a very unique way. Um, so they move into northern Africa and then slowly begin to move around the coast. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Um, second, they continue around the African coast all the way down um, to the Cape of Good Hope and then eventually around to East Africa. Um, and East Africa has its own trade networks that connect to India. And so Indian Ocean trade is going on. And this has been going on since before the Romans and the Greeks. So none of this is new. What's new is the fact that the Portuguese are plugging into these trade networks, and sometimes they're doing this by force. Um, the third thing that they want to do is they want to survey Atlantic Ocean. They want to understand what's out there. Um, there are thoughts that, well, obviously, they didn't recognize that North America was there or South America. So they're thinking that if they sail directly out, that they will run right into the Spice Islands, um, of Jakarta, Indonesia, and then into India. Hence, Columbus landing in Hispaniola and calling the natives Indians. And then, of course, number four is their development of navigation techniques and methods. And they're borrowing from earlier traditions. Um, their navigational tools like the astrolabe um, come from ancient Greece that were transferred into the Muslim world. The compass, um, the astrolabe is the picture in the upper right. The compass is the picture below that. It looks like a spoon. Um, but their understanding of magnetic fields and, you know, magnetic north and south um, greatly helps them in terms of navigating. So it's a very simplified compass. 
Um, also, they recognize latitude, but not longitude. Longitude does not come until the 1700s, um, and if you know where zero degrees longitude is, you know that it goes through Great Britain. Great Britain is the one that actually comes up with a tool to measure longitude. And so um, when they're sailing, they're sailing in a east-west direction, not north and south. Um, obviously out of practicality, because they're not re really sure what happens when you go north and south. So they're going to try and focus on east-west. And then, of course, cartography, the map making, um, gets a boost from the knowledge that they're picking up from the Muslim world. Now, the greatest innovation that the Portuguese give us is the caravel, and it's pictured in the bottom left. This is a very small, um, easily maneuverable ship, um, that has two forms. There's the Caravela Tilhada, which is the one that's used for commerce. And then there's the Caravela Redonda or Caravela de Armada, which, as you might suspect, um, is loaded with weaponry, cannon, sometimes soldiers, both. Um, they all travel together. So you've got a smaller ship that's easily maneuverable, which means not only does it allow for quick sailing, uh, but it also allows for um, Portuguese sailors to travel up and down rivers along the coast. So it allows for easy exploration of the coastline, which is why most of Portugal's exploration of Africa is isolated to the coast. Um, but it does make large-scale trading difficult because you've got to have several ships um, in an entourage um, in order to make the trip worth the cost. So you would have maybe 10, 15 of these Tilhada ships, but then you also have um, an armed um, contingent of Redonda or Armada ships um, surrounding it to protect them. Also, um, the Portuguese were very protective of their trade routes. And so the Caravela Redonda and De Armada um, are used to kind of police the, tra the trade route so that if you had uh, like a British ship or a French ship, that was trying to follow um, the trade networks of the Portuguese, um, they would come along, board the ship, um, make sure that you had paid your appropriate fee. Um, if you had not, then they would confiscate your goods, um, potentially ship, sink your ship. Um, so Portuguese were very, very um, protective of what they had amassed in terms of trade routes. <coughs> so the Portuguese make this kind of effort. Um, Ceuta at the very beginning, or the very top, um, is right there um, near the Strait of Gibraltar. It's conquered in 1415 by the Portuguese. Um, eventually, when um, Portugal begins to lose its empire, um, it will be transferred to Spain. Um, the Dutch will eventually come in and take many of the territories um, that the Portuguese have gained along the coast, but this is much later. Um, and that's another topic for World One, not for Florida history. Anyway, so you can see where they're making um, significant strides um, as they move further down the coast. In each of these places, they fortify. Um, so here's where I was talking about how they will by force sometimes plug into a trade network. Um, Morocco was important um, because it was at the tippy top to the, basically the, the west of the Sahara um, trade routes. Um, so all of these little fortresses that they're building um, have a contingent of soldiers and merchants. And so the ships would unload their goods. Um, the Portuguese would then begin to work with the natives in terms of moving their goods through these trade routes. Um, and they would trade for items that may have come from different portions of Africa. So they're picking up spices, cloth, um, slaves, um, and gold. I mean, it is important to recognize that there is an active slave trade prior to um, contact with Portuguese um, merchants. So there is, a, there is a, an Islamic slave trade. Um, However, it is not to the extent that, of course, Europeans will make it um, at a later point. But the important thing to remember about the Portuguese fortresses and the cities that they're building 
um, is that they are using force. They are not hiding that fact because, I mean, think about it. If you're a native and you see the Portuguese building a fortress, um, your automatic um, deduction is this is not a peaceful group of people who just happen to be building this really nice fort. Um, they are, in many cases, um, forcibly entering into trade with the different native populations. Um, the two pictures on the right are the same fort, um, Arguin um, Fort. Um, it's later picked up by the Dutch, but um, the Portuguese are the ones to originally build it. And of course, you can see the diagram at the top. It kind of shows you what it looks like. And it's very much about control. Um, the Portuguese discover what they call the Volta de Mar, which is the turn of the sea, which um, we call that the North Atlantic Drift. Um, it's um, connected to the Gulf Stream. But they know that if they sail out to the west, into the ocean, um, they can sail north or south eventually, and they'll hit this current. And so they begin to understand concepts such as currents and, um, you know, understanding the ocean better, and they become much better navigators um, because of this. Um, and the Portuguese are really the ones who are leading the charge at this point. Uh, they take advantage of this knowledge by um, moving along the coast of Africa, eventually moving to East Africa and then into um, India. Keep in mind, even Greek and Roman sailors knew about the monsoon pattern um, in India. So the Portuguese, no doubt, were very familiar with this. So there is a portion of the year where um, the winds and um, would push you towards India, and then there's a portion of the year where the winds would push you away from India. So all along these trade routes, they're establishing forts and settlements um, and leaving merchants there to trade with the native populations um, and those populations that are using seagoing vessels to trade. Um, and they continue all the way around. Um, and if you take a look, these are the Portuguese ports of contact throughout the world. So one thing you'll notice, there's not a lot of inland settlement. And there's a reason for that, because protection is coming from the caravels. It's coming from seagoing um, protection. And if they're going to establish these points of contact, then they need to be able to be protected. You'll also notice that uh, by 1500, the Portuguese have begun to settle in the Americas, or at least along the coast. Um, it's a little misleading because the green portion does go inland, um, but it's only so far inland. Um, most of what Brazil originally um, is producing for Portuguese is Brazil wood, which was highly favored wood. Um, and it was a luxury item at the time. Um, we have not gotten into sugar yet, and sugar is what really drives the Portuguese colony. But again, world one, don't need to talk about it. So where does Spain come along with their move towards exploration? Um, 1492 is a one of those kind of years that's very, very important, um, because if you are familiar, uh, 1492 was the year that Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Just by coincidence, it's also the same year that Ferdinand and Isabella complete the Reconquista in Spain, and they expel the Muslims and the Jews. So there's this massive migration out of Spain of Jews and um, Muslims who have not converted to Christianity. Many Jews and many Muslims convert to Christianity um, because of the policy of Ferdinand and Isabella. And that's where you get the Spanish Inquisition. But again, that is a World War I topic, not a topic for us to discuss um, here. Or maybe that's World II. Uh, but anyway, world history, nonetheless. So, but the key thing here is 1492. It is Columbus um, a part of this crusading effort? Can you make the argument that um, America, the discovery of America or discovery of the Americas is a step in this crusading effort? And that's a question many historians are looking at and making arguments. There are several historians who say yes. 
that the new world discovery is part of this um, larger crusading effort. And we'll see why in just a few seconds. So why didn't the Portuguese fund Columbus? Because he goes to Portugal. He approaches Portugal about funding his um, idea that if he sails far enough west, he will hit India. Um, and so why is it that Spain takes the lead on this? And the, the answer is actually very simple. Um, Portugal is not interested in cutting off um, its trade. It's got trade in Africa, it's got trade in Brazil now, um, and it's got trade into the Spice Islands. Um, so it doesn't really need um, this effort um, by Columbus. What the Spanish want is the Spanish want to kind of, um, they want a piece of the spice trade. And so for them, they're looking for an industry where they can gain a great deal of money. And trading is obviously the way to do it, as they witnessed with Portugal. Um, and so by sending Columbus out to the West, what they're hoping will happen is he will land in India, it will be a shorter route, um, and it will be a route that they can police and maintain and keep the Portuguese out. So they will kind of take over the spice trade in an ideal world. Of course, that's completely not what happens um, because they've got this two big land masses connected by this you know, narrow strip of land um, called the Americas that they run into. But they're very determined. You have a number of different Spaniards who travel throughout the Americas looking for gold. That's what they're looking for. Um, they find it in South America, they find it in portions of um, Central America, but unfortunately it's just not in North America anywhere. Um, so you have Coronado and you have De Soto, and we'll talk about De Soto in a second because he does play a portion um, in terms of uh, so the Treaty of Tortoise Alice, 1494, here is where you have King John of Portugal who writes to the, to the Pope, we need some sort of um, ruling on this, in other words, um, what's going to be Spain's, what's going to be Portugal's. And so what the Pope ends up doing is basically drawing a line on a map and saying, okay, everything to the west is Spanish, everything to the east is Portuguese. And both parties agree to this, and so by 1494, you have this kind of understanding. But the big key to all of this is what is it that Portugal wants to protect, and what is it that Spain wants to protect? And so the map that you're seeing, ignore the line of the Treaty of Saragossa for 1529. Um, we're not even going to talk about that. But the Tortoisalis is, is important in terms of Florida, because everything to the west of the line of demarcation from the treaty is Spanish. So that leaves open most of South America, most of North America, all of Central America. Um, to the east, you have Africa, you have um, India, Arabia, all of these places that are hotspots for Portuguese claims. So the Portuguese are happy with what they're doing. They're happy with, with this. The big thing, of course, is that the line goes right through modern-day Brazil. Um, keep in mind that the Portuguese are looking at the coast, not the interior. Interior was scary, not something they wanted to venture into, but the coast provided plenty of raw materials that they could utilize. So it cements the claims um, of Africa, India, but also Brazil for Portugal, and then it cements the rest of the Americas for Spain, and everybody's happy. So when Spain begins to move into colonization, um, I've included this primary document um, in the folder, um, and I want you to, to read over it. It's quite, well, it's one of those kind of ironies of history where you kind of laugh, and then at the same time you think, wow, this is really stupid. But um, Ferdinand and his daughter Wanta um, come up with this document called the El Recordentio, which is, means um, requirement. And so when they would discover new worlds or they would come ashore, so let's say um, in Mexico when they land, um, natives of course are coming out um, from the woods and onto the beach to see you know, who are these people. 
And all of a sudden, this person comes up with a document, a, a big parchment paper, and begins reading into Castilian Spanish um, the El Recomendio. Um, what the hell? What, why do they do this? What's the purpose? Um, do the Spanish honestly believe the natives understand them? Um, and the answer is, of course, no. I mean, they can't, couldn't possibly be that stupid. But the purpose of it is to read this list of, um, it gives a little bit of history. It tells, you know, who the king is, who the pope is, um, who, that we're all children of God. Um, but it issues a warning to the people that if you do not, one, convert, and two, subject yourself to the crown, um, that we will do everything we can to put you into slavery, basically to, to punish you, and it will all be on your head. Um, it, we absolve ourselves of any wrong um, in doing this. And so this is something that um, just defies logic. But my question to you is, who is this document directed to? Obviously, it's not directed to the to the native population because they're not, you know, Spanish aren't stupid enough to believe that these people speak Castilian. Um, more than not, um, the document is directed towards God um, and absolving the Spanish of any wrongdoing um, because simply these natives are defying the natural order of things. That God handed the king of Spain this land um, and therefore, anything that belong that, that exists on that land is at the the um, the whim of the king because that's what the king does. The king has absolute authority. So if these people resist, it's on them, not on us. So it's kind of an interesting um, concept. So in order to aid conquest, the Spanish create the Casa de Contracción, and I'm, you know, my Spanish is horrible. I apologize for those of you who actually speak Spanish. Um, I'm from the South, and, you know, I'm just, I, I apologize. Anyway, so what the Casa does is it's basically a joint stock company run by the Crown. Um, it's state-sponsored expedition and conquest. This is different, though, than what the Dutch and the English do. The joint stock companies of the Dutch and English are owned by companies. So imagine Starbucks, um, you know, leading, you know, a, a conquest of, you know, Mexico, for example. Um, that is what the British and the English do. Um, under Spain and Portugal, the state is heading up this company. Um, they're funneling all the money, it's money from the crown, um, that goes towards the running of expeditions and conquests. So what the CASA, basically, this, the CASA is this big, huge building, and in it, there are all these people who are tasked with collecting colonial dues and taxes, um, approving any exploration and trade, maintaining information on the trade routes and discovery, um, even secret information, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, they license all the captains, and they basically administer commercial law. So it's basically a state-sponsored um, agency, so to speak, that's tasked with conquest and colonization. Hopefully that makes sense. It's created by Isabella I in 1503. Um, this, there is also a um, version of this in Portugal. Um, the Casa de India um, in Lisbon. Again, India indicates that, well, in this case, uh, the Casa de India is focused on Indian trade. Um, but the Spanish, of course, are looking at um, the Americas. Um, all precious metal has a 20% tax on it, and this helps to fund um, the agency. Um, ships were expected to carry a clerk that basically is like an accountant, um, keeping track of everything. And then all of those transactions are turned into the Casa at the end of the voyage. So when they come back um, to Spain, um, yes, then when they come back to Spain, then all of these things are turned in. The other thing is that the Casa maintains the secret Pedron Real, which is the official and super secret Spanish map. And it was this huge map that hung in the Casa. 
And so when Spanish voyages would come back, either exploration or colonization or anything like that, um, the ships were required, the captains were required to turn in their maps. And any new information or corrections was added to this new Pedron, or, or was added to the Pedron Real. Um, and then when a ship would be contracted to go off to, let's say, um, South America, for example, or Peru, um, the CASA would hand them a new map, an updated map that was copied from the Pedro Real. Um, and so it becomes kind of like um, state secrets, if you will. Um, in addition, the CASA ran School for Navigation, um, and of course, new pilots were trained um, at the CASA. So the Pe Pedro, not pardon, Real, um, here's a kind of a copy of the map. We don't have the original secret map, um, but you know, obviously it was updated with the, the newest information. And this is something that they borrowed from the Portuguese that the Spanish have. Um, but it's kind of an interesting concept that this was considered state secrets. So what does conquest mean? Um, first of all, you need to be familiar with the idea of res nullis, which means ownerless property. That if you don't have some sort of type of ownership, then land is open for conquest. So, you know, Spain can claim most of North America, but if it doesn't, if Spain doesn't have feet on the ground, soldiers to protect it, um, and ships and army to um, keep it from falling into enemy hands, then rightfully so, they are asking for um, other countries to come in and take control. We'll talk about why this is important in a second. <clears throat> so assuming ownership meant, one, you have a symbolic claim of ownership. That means that you've got some sort of claim. Uh, for Spain, of course, it was a Treaty of Tordesalus that gave them claims to North America. Um, you have to have physical occupation of land. So you needed forts, and in Florida's case, you're going to have missions. Um, this is something that North America is missing at this point, at this point in time. But in Mexico, um, in the islands of the Caribbean, you have a great deal, uh, a large number of forts and settlers that are living um, within that territory. And so it's recognized as Spanish control. And obviously, you have to have people. You have to have colonists to help develop the land. Um, by develop, they use the word um, improve, improve the land. Um, their interpretation of improve means you're clearing it and you're making it suitable for cultivation and you're growing crops. That's what they mean by improve um, or develop. So that's what they're looking at. Spanish conquest of New Spain. This is where we have the first efforts by Spain to conquer territory. Of course, they pinpoint the Aztecs, the Mayans, and the Inca. Um, the ones we'll be focusing on, of course, are the Aztecs and the Inca. So Spain sees these, um, in their interactions with the, the native population, they see evidence of precious metals, silver and gold. Um, and of course, that makes you a target. And so in 1519, you have the launch of the conquest of the Aztecs. Uh, Montezuma II is the ruler, and he's taken out um, by Cortez. Cortez essentially uses the rivalries between the different states. So if you see the map on the right, you have the core state around Tenochtitlan, which was the capital city. But then you have these other tributary and allied states um, that are basically at the whim of Montezuma. Cortez comes in and says, you know, what would be nice is if we could, um, you know, get rid of Montezuma and make you the head of the empire. Um, and of course, they buy into this. Um, little do they know that they'll become, you know, pretty much a puppet state. But um, so the Spain Spaniards basically say, we're going to help you out and make this happen. And by 1521, you have the fall of Tenochtitlan and the removal of Montezuma. Of course, what ends up happening um, is you have a large number of native um, populations that are 
decimated by disease. And of course, um, Spanish control ends up being the only um, real authority within the territory. Um, very similar things happen in the conquest of the Inca in 1532 under Pizarro. Um, you have a ruler who dies. He dies of smallpox, which smallpox, um, people who die of smallpox at this period of time seems to suggest that they had interactions with Europeans earlier. So probably um, the ruler who dies was some sort of, um, or had some sort of interaction with the Spanish already. But anyway, he leaves control um, in basically in the hands of his sons um, who fight over who's going to take over. Pizarro sides with Atahualpa um, over his brother um, because he feels like he can control Atahualpa. Um, unfortunately, Atahualpa ends up being um, more of a um, resistor than a yes man, and so he ends up dying in captivity. And the picture on the bottom left is um, Atahualpa um, on his deathbed and the Inca mourning his death, um, but he's surrounded, of course, by priests. And there's a funny interaction between Pizarro and Atahualpa. Um, Atahualpa keeps hearing Pizarro refer to the Bible says this, the Bible says that. And so Atahualpa goes up to the Bible and puts his ear to it and says, why doesn't it speak to me? Um, because he honestly believes that the Bible will talk. Um, and he doesn't understand that Pizarro is, you know, reading the Bible and interpreting it. But anyway, kind of funny aside for historians. Okay, so Spanish conquest on the ground, what does it look like? Um, you have a lack of, of centralized leadership. This plagued Spain um, throughout its colonial empire. Um, the Viceroy, um, there are two. There's one over Mexico and one over South America, essentially the uh, in Peru. Um, under the Viceroy, you have all these local leaders who are act, actually sanctioned to act on their own. They can do pretty much whatever they want to do. You do have a legal advisory council that if they feel like the Viceroy or the leaders are acting out of turn, they can appeal to the king and the, the king will take care of it. But obviously distance and the terrain play a role in the ability to control the empire. Uh, Mexico is relatively flat, but Peru is not. So you have um, different terrain that seems to inhibit the control that the Viceroy has over the empire. The other thing is the Encomendia labor system. Um, essentially you have, once Spain takes control, you have this large um, population of native uh, people. How do you combine them or, or organize them to where they become labor? Um, so you make, basically a, a, an encomendia is a portion of land, it's like a land grant of several hundred acres. Um, encomendieros who are the leader or the owners of that land or, or the receiver, they receive the land grant, build a hacienda, which is the, the ranch, and they begin cultivating crops. Um, labor is provided by native populations in the area, so they create these agreements called recudiones um, with chiefs or leaders, and they basically say, okay, we'll protect you, we'll give you supplies, we'll you know, aid you in whatever we, way we can. Um, all you have to do is provide us with, you know, we need 100 men, you will provide us with 100 men. Um, in an ideal world, that sounds like a relatively you know, tit for tat kind of relationship. Um, in fact, it actually isn't. Um, the working conditions are horrible. Um, not only do the population suffer from disease, but the mortality rate is really high based on the working conditions. They're working the men essentially like slaves. Um, in some cases, you have encomendieros who are cruel, um, who will just shoot people for being disobedient. Um, and, you know, it just goes downhill from there. Um, when at the same time that these men are, or these natives are working on the hacienda, the church is trying to, to convert them through um, education. And this is where the order of the Jesuits come in. We'll talk a little bit more about them in another um, portion of the module. But essentially their attitude is, okay, I know you're, you're going through a tough time, you know, working conditions are hard, your labor is hard, but you know what? When you die, you're gonna have your reward in heaven. Well, that's not going to really make native populations feel any better, unfortunately.
So when we look at Florida and how Florida begins to interact with this colonial empire, hopefully you see that there's a great deal of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not a ideal situation. Um, you have the ability of people to basically exploit Indian labor, um, and they're looking for specific things, namely precious metals. Um, they're not really looking to make the colony a lasting success, um, which uh, gradually they do um, begin to focus on that in the long term, but in the short term, they're, they're still looking for gold. Ponce de Leon um, comes along um, and he begins his process of Florida exploration. Take a look at the different dates. It kind of gives you an idea of, of, you know, he's not just coming to Florida. Um, he's trying to make a go of it. Um, he earns a claim on the territory of Florida and Bimini, and he decides he's going to inspect it and take a look at it. Where he lands, we don't really know. Where he sites land, we don't really know. Um, Daytona claims it. St. Augustine claims it. Jacksonville claims it. You know, we don't really know for sure. Um, but he does make landfall um, in the southern part of Florida on the Gulf side. Um, in 1521, he has 200 colonists, and he decides he's going to make a settlement. Um, however, part of the problem is something that he doesn't realize, and it's really not his fault, um, is that Florida had been visited prior to Ponce de Leon, and many of the native population um, were taken in as slaves. And so they recognized Spanish ships and the Spaniards in a negative way, and so rather than Indians welcoming them, um, they shoot them with arrows. Um, Ponce, Ponce Leon is injured. He's taken back to Cuba and eventually dies. However, one of the things that Ponce Leon discovers is the Gulf Stream. And this is right here called the Florida Current here. But the Gulf Stream runs right off the coast of Florida, and makes that turn right about Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, this is important because this will aid navigation to Spain. So when you have these um, ships coming out of the Caribbean, out of, the, out of Mexico, and then out of South America, they will take this route um, and it will mean that they can follow in an easier way back to Spain, these currents. Um, it also means that you need to be looking in this area for some sort of protection um, for the fleets. And that's where St. Augustine is going to come into um, existence. You have a number of um, what I like to call Florida contestants. These are people who begin the process of settling, um, but they do it in a really, really bad way and none of them are successful. Allion decides he's going to settle in modern day South America. He is a um, tied to the slave trade, so he brings a number of slaves with him. After about two months, the people are starving and they're, um, they've got disease and things are just not good. And so the colonists rebel. Um, historians argue that this is the first rebellion, slave rebellion to take place because you do have African slaves um, in this colony. Um, that are part of this rebellion. So you can make the argument that this is the first slave rebellion in North America. Um, Allion ends, ends up dying and then 150 of his survivors make it back to Hispaniola, which um, it's, Hispaniola is um, Haiti and Dominican Republic today. Narvez is our next contestant. He decides, okay, well, obviously um, South Carolina ain't gonna work. So let's try Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay was a deep water bay, um, still is, um, and so it became ideal for large ships to come into um, the bay and they basically unload um, and they're looking for gold. So they're not really taking into account anything that they're seeing. Um, they're strictly looking for um, gold. So he has 300 colonists and 40 horses, not our sis. I don't I must have been drunk writing this. But anyway, he doesn't make friends with the Indians, and they end up getting pushed off. Um, and so they build barges to escape. They make it to the Texas coastline, um, which is over in here somewhere. 
Um, and they land in on the beach and they basically begin walking to Texas. That may sound insane um, to us because we recognize the map and we know what things look like, but keep in mind, they didn't know these things. They thought Mexico was a lot closer um, than it actually was. And then we come to DeSoto. Um, DeSoto leaves Havana with about 600 soldiers, lands around Tampa Bay, very similar to um, what our previous contestant did. Um, and like our previous contestant, he decides he's going to look for gold and precious metal. There's no attempt whatsoever to write down anything about the nature, um, plants, crops, animals, nothing like that. Um, he doesn't really write down anything about the settlements. So it all points to the fact that this guy is looking strictly for wealth. He treats the natives horribly um, and uses a number of tactics that were common with crusading efforts. Um, in Spain with the Reconquista. Um, he treats them harshly and violently. Um, and the native populations remember this. Unfortunately for DeSoto, he makes his way through all of these different routes through all these different Indian towns. And in every one of them, he just basically takes what he wants and doesn't really give a toot. Um, and so, you know, 100 years later, when you have um, Spaniards moving into these territories, or, or even British or French, um, the people remember this, and they either resist them through fighting, or they run away. So um, De Soto makes a horrible public relations nightmare for any of the explorers who are trying to, to um, explore or conquer this territory, because the Indians remember everything that he did to them. Um, our last contestant is Arellano. Um, this is when Pensacola is founded. Um, of course, it's not a permanent colony. They leave and they try to go to South Carolina, Santa Elena, specifically, which will uh, feature in our discussion about the French. Um, they're told to go to Santa Elena and they are given a new governor. Um, Arellano basically is told, you got to come back to Spain. Uh, we're going to charge you with dereliction of duty. So um, obviously another failure. Um, in their travels to Santa Elena, um, the men desert and return back to Mexico. And so again, we're left with no settlements and no attempt at colonization or lasting attempt. So why Florida? Arellano's expedition is the last attempt. Um, Florida is determined to be without resources and not worth the Spanish effort. And this is a report that, that Pedro Mendez himself makes. So what is it that changes the mind of Philip and his advisors and pushes for this um, expansion into Florida? And this is a map showing um, on the left basically the currents, and there's there's our good old Gulf Stream right there. Um, and so the ships are coming out and they use that to return to Spain. Now, the big problem is right here. What happens when you have a shipwreck that's loaded with precious metals um, and the survivors are basically left to fend for themselves? And here's where, here's one of the reasons why Philip is, um, going to push for colonization along Florida's coast is because if you have somewhere where the survivors can go, then you can find the shipwreck easier. But we'll talk about that one later. So what's happening within Europe that's making this, um, that's going to drive the push for Florida? Essentially, Charles V, the Habsburg ruler, um, he's the ruler during the Reformation. Um, he is, of course, Catholic, um, and he supports Catholicism, but he has to deal with the rise of Protestant denominations throughout Europe. And many of the princes within the Holy Roman Empire are supportive of Protestantism, basically because it means that they're reducing the power of the emperor. Um, and that's another whole world history topic. But, um, so they're fearful, you know, European leaders are fearful of a strong Holy Roman Empire. 
Um, and so they work against Charles. And over time, Charles just has enough and decides at the age of 54, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it up. And so he abdicates his throne um, to his brother, Ferdinand I, and Ferdinand takes control of Austria and the Holy Roman Empire. He puts his son, Philip II, um, as the king of Spain, essentially in charge of the Spanish Empire. He also weds Philip to Mary, who is the daughter of Henry VIII. Um, Henry's first wife is a staunch Catholic. Um, it's obviously, I think, if you know your British history or European history, um, you know that Henry leads the English Reformation and converts to Catholic or to uh, Protestantism. Um, but that Mary, after his death, when Henry dies, um, his daughter Mary takes control of Britain and tries to bring back, bring, bring back Catholicism. So Philip the First, or I'm sorry, Philip the Second comes to the throne. Um, under his reign, you have the wars of religion and specifically the war for Dutch independence. Um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, after the death of Mary, um, of, who is the queen of England, um, you have Elizabeth the first that comes to the throne, um, who was the other daughter of Henry VIII. Um, and Philip doesn't like the fact that Elizabeth is trying to bring back the Church of England and separate from the Catholic Church. So he brings together this huge Spanish armada, um, which costs a great deal of money. Um, and of course, it ends in defeat for Spain. So England will remain a Protestant state. But Philip really believes that he is the chosen defender of Catholic Europe, um, not only against Muslims, but also against the Protestant Reformation. He defeats the Ottoman Navy at the Battle of Lepanto, um, but his big concern is the Netherlands. The Netherlands revolt. Uh, there's a portion of the ne Netherlands that revolt against him, and they are the ones that are under Protestant control. And so if, with Philip's zealous devotion to Catholicism, I mean, he's, he literally is almost a fanatic when it comes to Catholicism, um, it pushes the Netherlands even more towards revolt. If he had been a little bit more moderate, he might have been able to save it. Um, there are a number of wars that happen within Europe. The Thirty Years' War splits um, Europe into different sides. But again, you have England on the same side as France um, and Russia and Denmark. Um, and all of these countries are fearful of the Holy Roman Empire. Um, of, of course, Philip is going to side with um, his uncle. Um, but the Thirty Years' War is really a war about religion, uh, Protestants versus Catholics. Um, what ends up coming out of the Thirty Years' War is an agreement that individual states within the Holy Roman Empire can determine if they're going to be Protestant or Catholic. Um, and so it gives them a great deal of religious freedom. France has its own issues to deal with. It has its own wars of religion. And you have between two to four million people who are killed as a result of the wars of religion within France. Um, and so the king who is French is looking for some sort of way to deal with this large Protestant um, population within his country. And so he's looking for something that will help um, end this internal conflict. So keep that in mind as we move forward a little bit. Um, this is a slide talking about the Dutch independence. Again, the northern states are the states that are more Protestant, and they are more likely to separate from Spain from Philip's control. The southern states are the ones that are held by Spain, and they um, will continue to be so. Of course, this becomes Belgium. Um, but what do you think Philip's reaction is to the loss of the Netherlands? You have these leaders who emerge within the Netherlands um, who are pushing Protestant religion and pushing a separation between um, Spain and the Netherlands. And of course, Philip is irate about this. So within France, um, you have an ally with with Philip. So Philip looks at France as the French 
to the French monarchy as a friend, a fellow Catholic. Um, but you have people within the French government who begin to see the new world as a safety valve or a solution to the problem of what to do with this rising Protestant um, population. And so many of the Huguenots who are the French Protestants, um, who are followers of Calvinism, um, begin to flee France. So suddenly, de, Gaspard de Coligny comes up with this idea. Why not have a colony in the New World where we can ship all of these Protestants um, and all of the revenue that they bring in from this colony will benefit French treasuries? So we'll make money and we'll get rid of the people at the same time. Um, <coughs> Jean Ribot is a Protestant French who leaves France in 1562 for the New World. He sails around, he finds um, the St. John's River, the mouth of course Mayport, <coughs> excuse me, and then he travels north to South um, Carolina and finds um, this area around Paris Island. He forms a settlement there and he builds a fort um, called Charles Fort and he leaves 27 men there. He goes back to France, gets delayed because of the wars of religion. The French colonists in the meantime basically rebel and decide we're getting the hell out of here. They sail across the Atlantic and wind up in British waters. The British welcome them back into um, the fold because they're fellow Protestants, not Catholics. So the, the British are very kind to these people. Um, they eventually do, I think they do, do eventually return back to France, but um, there's a second voyage. This time, Ribot will not be the leader. Lord Nair will be the leader, and they will try to resettle this um, Charles Fort. Um, and then Ribot follows um, in the spring of 1565. So they build these two settlements, um, and I don't have... I'm gonna skip. Um, so you have these two settlements that are formed, um, Charles Fort um, in 1562 um, that runs until 1564, and then you have Fort Caroline that picks up in 1564 to 1565. Um, 1565 should be like a neon sign blaring at you because that's the founding of St. Augustine. So what is Philip's reaction to this? Well, Philip finds out that there are Protestants who are moving into his land. Um, Remember, North America is considered La Florida. And he's ticked, he's pissed. One, because he knows that the French king is aware of this, but isn't saying anything to him. He even goes on an embassy to the French king, giving him an opportunity to tell him about it. And the French king refuses, to, he will not say anything to him. Not that he refuses, but he's just not gonna admit it um, because this is a solution to the problem that he has, but he knows that Philip's is gonna be upset about it. And so it causes a rift between the two. And of course, this is what changes the mind of Philip. Um, not only does he need a place for shipwreck victims, um, which will solve that problem, but it also has a religious undertone because it means now you have heretics, Protestants, who are invading Catholic territory, and this is unacceptable to Philip. So that is what drives him to conquest of Florida. So we're going to pick up in part three in hopefully just a few minutes.